Good morning, everybody. We're going to try something new. Uh, I've been doing the ventilator talk for a couple of years now. Um, it's a relatively new talk that we started after we recognized uh, this gap in medical student education and realizing that uh, students need to have um, a little bit of exposure, a little bit of uh, understanding of how to assess their patients on the ventilator prior to becoming doctors. And so we uh, felt that the surgical clerkship was a good place to fit that in. Um, there's a lot of material here. And so for some time I've been thinking about breaking it up to some pre-class work um, and then making the class more of a discussion-based approach. Um, now with the COVID, crisis and a lot of experimenting in educational technology along with the fact that I'm working on a master's in education and taking a class on technology and education that this would be a good opportunity to uh, break things up and try some new strategies out so bear with me as this is the first time that I've created an educational video and then we're going to follow this up part two will be the interactive discussion uh, part one today our goal is to just lay some of the groundwork for uh, what you'll be um, applying when we all reconvene. So uh, the plan is going to be, you should watch this video. This is asynchronous learning, so you can watch it whenever you want. Uh, pause it as needed. Some of the material is a little uh, deep. Um, there's going to be a practice exercise uh, in your email. There's a link to a survey monkey quiz. Um, I don't care how you do on the quiz. That's not the purpose of this. Uh, the quiz is so that you can assess whether uh, you got out of this talk what you needed to get out of it. And then on Friday, we will have our Zoom interactive lecture where we apply more of this material. So hopefully you'll participate then, and, uh, and then I'll survey you to see what you thought of the whole process. Uh, these are our objectives. Um, some of them we will be trying to meet during part one of this session, uh, and then some of them we'll be addressing in part two. Um, the main things I want you to come away from is, you know, being able to recognize and initially stabilize a, a sick patient with respiratory distress, with all things, you should always be thinking about your differential diagnosis. Um, you've probably had a lot of uh, lectures and talks on interpretation of blood gases, but I think they uh, take a new light as you uh, start to apply them in a ventilator setting, um, thinking about different levels of support. And then finally, the meat of it really is assessing and managing a patient on a ventilator with a few of the basic modes. So prior to getting on the ventilator, um, you may have escalating levels of respiratory support. Um, and when I say respiratory support, this slide primarily focuses on um, oxygenation. And so uh, don't forget, at room air, we're at 21% FiO2. We're not going to withhold oxygen from patients. And so uh, that's kind of your minimum. When you put a nasal cannula on a patient, uh, depending on what you read, um, that will add anywhere from one to 4% to FiO2 per liter. So you can imagine if they're on um, four liters nasal cannula, that's adding perhaps 12% to the 21. And, and so you might be in the ballpark of maybe 40% FiO2. Um, some would argue that it's actually quite a bit less than that because of mixing and mouth breathing. Um, so it's pretty unreliable, but that's at least what you may read. Uh, venti mask uh, will get you around that 40 or 50 percent FiO2. That's why once we get up over four to six liters of uh, traditional nasal cannula, you usually switch over to the venti mask. Or if you've got a mouth breather, a venti mask might be appropriate. The non-rebreather mask um, avoids recirculation of the exhaled uh, breath, and so you can theoretically get up to 100% FiO2. Again, it's not a closed system, so it's not truly 100% FiO2, but it's much higher. Um, I want to pause here for a moment and just um, emphasize that if you've gotten up to a non-rebreather mask 
on a floor patient that you're managing, keep in mind, as hard as it is to believe that, you know, less than two years from now, you're going to have MD at the end of your name and you are going to be in charge of patients and you are going to be called about patients on the floor. If you've uh, escalated to a level of a non-rebreather mask for a patient on the floor, uh, you should be concerned about that patient. And perhaps you're fixing something that you anticipate will get better in the next couple of hours. You're diuresing them or giving them a nebulizer treatment or fill in the blank how you're treating them acutely. Um, but if you're not actively fixing something, then the floor is not a good place for that patient because that patient really doesn't have much reserve. And if they decompensate even a tiny bit more, um, and you or the nurse taking care of seven other patients aren't there to, to witness it, um, you could have a very bad event. So if you escalate a patient to a non-rebreather mask, you should highly be considering putting them in a different level of care, um, specifically an ICU setting. Uh, high flow nasal cannula is kind of newer on the scene. It didn't even exist when I was a resident in the ICU 10 years ago, or at least it didn't exist in Buffalo. And um, that provides a lot of extra support, extra oxygenation, a little bit of uh, PEEP. Um, and so that's a great uh, tool. Um, actually, one of the recommended uh, modes of support for uh, patients with COVID even. And so um, that is uh, an important uh, modality to keep in mind. And then CPAP and BiPAP, uh, you may be familiar with already for patients that have sleep apnea, um, but it also is something that's used um, as a supportive measure. Uh, keep in mind, uh, there's not a lot of great rescue um, from this, these modes. It's very good for rescuing patients with uh, CHF or COPD, so you'll see it used more in the medical population. Um, that doesn't mean right or wrong. It just means a different patient population. Whereas surgical patients, if they've got respiratory failure, respiratory distress, usually it's because there's a problem that needs to be treated. Um, and so usually our patients, we would intubate at that point as opposed to uh, doing BiPAP or CPAP. Uh, another problem with BiPAP and CPAP in patients um, surgical patients is a lot of our patients have uh, obstructions or reasons for ileus, post-op abdominal patients. And so we don't want to be forcing a bunch of air swallowing, um, which greatly increases the risk of aspiration. So again, um, there are specific patients that this is very good for, um, but a lot of patients, we skip this step. We do not um, do that. Invasive respiratory support uh, refers to intubating the patient and putting them on the ventilator. And so there's just a, a small list of different ventilator modes um, here uh, in front of you. Uh, there's actually quite a bit more. Um, whenever there's a lot of something, it usually means it's because there's no perfect thing. If there was a perfect mode, then everyone would be using it. Um, you'll find that these modes tend to be regional, uh, institutional, and even um, intensivist um, based, and meaning um, even within a single institution, uh, you'll see that some intensivists favor certain modes and some intensivists favor other modes. Um, you'll also hopefully see that some modes just seem to be more appropriate for certain patients, um, while other modes are better for other patients. In Buffalo, most commonly, uh, you'll see PRVC or VCAC, and that's what we're going to focus our talk on. If you can understand um, that mode, and I kind of use them interchangeably, um, if you can understand that mode, then a lot of other modes, most other modes, you can um, still understand within that setting. Uh, prior to, to moving on, I do want to just kind of point out uh, what we're talking about. So 
uh, we're talking about a patient on a ventilator. So when you put a patient on a ventilator, at least initially, uh, that ventilator is going to take full control over the patient's breathing. You can um, have two different ways of choosing how the breath is delivered to the patient. You can either say that you want a, um, a breath that delivers a certain volume, or you can say that you want a breath that delivers a certain pressure. Um, if you uh, choose pressure, then you don't have any actual uh, exact measure of what volume is being delivered. Um, and so uh, pressure control is used in some settings, but more commonly um, volume control, meaning we choose the volume that's delivered to the patient is used. And so PRVC is pressure regulated volume control. Um, and VCAC is volume control, assist control. Um, those modes, you're guaranteeing the volume to the patient. And we'll look more at that, but I want you to just keep in mind that we're talking about a system where you're controlling what the patient receives, um, how much of a breath, uh, technically how quickly the breath is received, how many breaths are received, all of these inner workings um, now you're controlling instead of the patient. And so uh, that's kind of the, the very basic of what a, a ventilator is. We'll return to the blood gas. So looking at foundations, um, you know, this is the information you get about a patient, you get their blood gas, uh, dissecting out the components, um, first looking at bicarb and base excess. These numbers are extremely important. Uh, to us as trauma surgeons, these are the numbers we care about. When a patient first comes in, um, they might have a relatively normal heart rate and blood pressure, but if they have a metabolic acidosis or a base deficit, um, I'm going to look at them more closely because prior to their blood pressure dropping, prior to their hemoglobin dropping, the first sign of hypoperfusion is going to be acidosis because at a cellular level, those cells are not getting adequate perfusion. They're kicking over to anaerobic respiration. They're creating lactic acid. And that's the first sign, especially in a young person, that, um, that something's not right. And so that's why we value a blood gas so highly. Uh, that is all I'm going to say for this lecture. I think it's um, separate from ventilators, but so important that I still wanted to mention it. So no further talk on metabolic acidosis here. For the rest of the gas, you've got the components of uh, PCO2, PO2, and saturations. And at this point, I want you in your head to uh, firmly separate ventilation and oxygenation. Uh, these are nearly independent of each other. And so ventilation, even though we think of the word ventilation as referring to the ventilator, ventilation really is specific to carbon dioxide exchange. And so when we use the term ventilation now, that's what we're referring to. We're referring to our PCO2. Oxygenation, is a little simpler. That's our PO2 and our saturation. So focusing just on oxygenation, this is a question that I always uh, like to ask in groups because it's kind of a trick question, um, but we'll just cover it here because it's a video. So when you're thinking about what matters more, you have two different measures of oxygenation. You've got your PO2 and you've got your saturation. From a diagnostic standpoint, the PO2 is very helpful. Um, it allows you to calculate a P to F ratio, and that can tell you about your severity of ARDS. It can tell you just in general about how the parenchyma of the lungs are doing. Um, it also allows you to calculate an AA gradient, um, which might help you to determine if you have a high suspicion for PE. So from a diagnostic standpoint, PO2 is very helpful. However, 
what do we titrate our changes to? So what do we titrate our FiO2 to? Do we care about what the PO2 is? Are we gonna bump up our oxygen just because of a low PO2, even if the SATs are okay? That's the question. And sometimes on rounds, a resident will tell me, oh, I increased the FiO2 because the PO2 was low, but the saturations were okay. So is that the right thing to do? And to answer that question, we have to think about what what we're doing, what are we trying to accomplish in our care of the patient? And remember, when you're caring for the patient, you're really just caring for a ball of a trillion cells. What you care about is that each of those cells is getting perfused with oxygen so that it can continue to undergo aerobic respiration. And so you care about the delivery of oxygen to each cell. And if you dig deep down into your brain, you might recall that there's a formula for the delivery of oxygen, and that's this here. So you've got oxygen delivery is related to your cardiac output, that's a different lecture, um, times your hemoglobin, which there's other trials to determine what the optimal hemoglobin is, times your saturation, times 1.34, plus PO2 times 0 0.003. So when you're looking at the delivery of oxygen, you've got this big number here plus a teeny tiny little number being multiplied by the PO2. What that tells us is that the PO2 with respect to delivery of oxygen is actually insignificant. So don't make any titration changes based on the PO2. Make your titration changes for oxygen based on the saturation. And that's actually quite convenient because you have a continuous saturation monitor, but the PO2 you get in your blood gas. So that tells us that, you know, the blood gas, the arterial blood gas is really just used diagnostically. Again, if we're going to look at P to F ratio, or more uncommonly, the AA gradient, then an arterial blood gas is important. Um, but otherwise, just, just go by the SAT as far as oxygenation is concerned. Now, uh, returning to what I was talking about, PRVC or VCAC, these are pressure regulated volume control or volume control assist control. Most people just still call it PRVC. Um, that's what our uh, old vents uh, uh, use um, the new dragger vents that we got at ECMC, uh, use VCAC. All the settings are the same. There's probably some slight differences that are uh, within the vent that, that don't really matter to you. Um, but just kind of, you can think of these for the most part as interchangeable. Um, so this is a control node. This means that any patient, uh, be they chemically paralyzed, be they uh, you know, traumatically paralyzed, uh, if they're brain dead, if they're under general anesthesia, or if they're just heavily sedated, no matter what the situation, um, these patients are ventilated because we're assuming full control. So that guarantees us a minute ventilation. We'll talk about minute ventilation soon. Uh, it does pressure regulate though. So I mentioned you can either deliver a certain pressure to the patient or you can deliver a certain volume to the patient. If you deliver a certain volume to the patient, you do have to be concerned about barotrauma. If I decided to deliver two liter breath to a patient, um, that's gonna cause a problem. Most patients can't take a two liter breath um, without reaching a high pressure. And so both of these settings have internal pressure uh, regulations. Uh, with the case of PRVC, you can see it right in the name. And so even if you say, I want X amount of tidal volume, internally, the machine won't deliver more than um, what gets up to the, the internally set maximum pressure. Um, so, so it's great because you can, you can set a minute ventilation, um, but the machine will be protective to the patient. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind with these modes is that every initiated breath becomes a ventilated breath. So the machine is continually interacting uh, 
with the patient. And these machines have um, really been developed over the past 20 years or longer um, to a point where they're very, very smart. Um, and so first of all, when a patient initiates a breath, the machine senses that and the machine turns that breath into a ventilated breath. So if the patient starts to inhale a little bit, the machine senses it, and then it will deliver the breath that you set. Say if you set, I want 500 ml breaths, um, it will deliver 500 mLs. And it's also continually interacting with the patient, uh, measuring the pressure, measuring the flow, uh, delivering that breath at a flow rate that reaches the minimal pressure possible. So uh, what this means for you as the physician um, putting the patient on the ventilator is uh, you want to keep in mind the, the maximal pressure. So even if you order a certain volume, they may not receive it, and you'll see that as you watch the patient. Um, you also uh, want to keep in mind that even if you set a certain rate, the patient may initiate more breaths than that rate. Um, and we'll talk more about that also. Um, but it's a good mode for a patient that needs a fully controlled um, respiration. And so we're going to spend a little more time on understanding that. Um, because it's a good go-to mode for most patients initially. So now that's the question. Again, two years from now, you've got a patient that's decompensated, that you need orders, you have to decide what to order. So the things that you need to order as a physician are in this left-hand column. You have to determine your FiO2 for every mode, setting, even non-ventilated patients as we talked about, you determine what their FiO2 is going to be. Uh, you also have to determine their PEEP, the uh, respiratory rate, which is really just the minimum respiratory rate, since the patient can breathe over that, and the tidal volume. Now, there's other internal settings to the ventilator, but those are the key four that you have to determine. Um, behind the scenes, the respiratory therapists understand the vent far better than most intensivists. They know a lot of internal settings um, and they sometimes tinker. So there's a lot of other things that can be changed uh, that you may not even realize are going on. Uh, so one is the trigger mode and sensitivity. I told you that if a patient initiates a breath, the vent will take over. So the question is, what is the sensitivity of that? If the patient has the hiccups, is that gonna turn every hiccup into a breath? We don't want that. Um, and so uh, trigger mode and sensitivity has to do with how those breaths are um, recognized and uh, what turns um, into a breath. The uh, flow rate, and so that's how quickly the breath goes in. Uh, some of that the ventilator is sensing and optimizing. Some of that uh, can be set uh, by the respiratory therapist. Um, Related to that is also the inspiratory time. So how long is it going to take to deliver the breath? And then there's other things too. There's so many things uh, beyond the scope of this lecture. Spending some time with a good respiratory therapist is, is worth your while. So again, coming back to ventilation and oxygenation. Keeping in mind, ventilation is strictly carbon dioxide exchange, oxygenation, we're going to focus on the saturation. Um, these are the settings that relate to those two different arms. And so, again, when I was first um, learning about this stuff, I found it kind of counterintuitive that tidal volume really had nothing to do with oxygenation. Um, and certainly at the great extremes it does. If you have a tidal volume of zero or uh, you're not going to be having any ventilation, and of course, then you can't oxygenate. But within appropriate ranges, the tidal volume and the respiratory rate really have little effect on oxygenation. Those are related to your carbon dioxide exchange, your ventilation. Your FiO2 and your PEEP have to do with your oxygenation. <clears throat> 
that's a little more intuitive, I think. So what do I order? So how do I set these four things? How do I determine a tidal volume, a respiratory rate, an FiO2, and a PEEP? As the physician, I need to write these orders. They're pressuring me for orders right now. So we'll start with FiO2. Again, room air is 21%, so that's kind of your basement. Um, but if you have a patient who just decompensated, you want to remove as many variables as possible as quickly as possible. And so um, for the patient who just decompensated, the easiest, quickest thing to do is start them at 100%. Remove that variable. Do you want to leave them at 100% till tomorrow? Absolutely not. You got free radicals, you've got no reserve. You do not want your patient to stay at 100%. You want to rapidly titrate that down, but first get them stabilized. So start at 100% and then titrate down rapidly. Eventually, you want your target to be less than 40%. Um, in the MICU, you tend to see patients at 30% or even down to 21%. Um, our patients, we tend to stop at 40%. Why? I don't know. Maybe we should go lower. I think part of the difference, again, is the different patient populations. So uh, medical patients tend to be ventilated for longer periods of time because they don't have things that, that are as often being actively fixed, whereas our patients, we tend to be fixing a problem. They've, they've just overcome a trauma and they're just, you know, getting over the hump and then they're going to be fine or, or they just had a septic event and we took them to the OR and we fixed it and then we're going to extubate them. Uh, our, our patients' respiratory failures more often tend to be related to a different cause that we fixed. And so for that reason, usually by the time we get to 40% or less, we're, we're just getting them off the ventilator, whereas um, medical patients or some of our patients um, that have less fixable problems, um, it's worthwhile to drive that FiO2 down lower because they're going to be on the vent longer. Um, the bottom line, go as low as you can. Uh, you want to avoid things like absorption, atelectasis, hypercapnia, um, lack of reserve. It's a big one. You know, uh, so patients tend to um, have events when they're in the ICU, meaning uh, they may have a mucus plug or when they're turned, um, you know, minor, minor things can cause a massive desaturation in patients uh, that are very tenuous. And so it is good to um, have some reserve. If uh, you're riding a patient at 90% FiO2 and um, and then they have one of those events, a little mucus plug, you don't have anywhere to go abruptly and uh, that can have much more negative consequences. Whereas if you're riding them at 40% and they have one of those events, you can bump up the FiO2, get them suctioned, get them taken care of, and then, um, and then move on and titrate it back down. Uh, PEEP is your positive end expiratory pressure. Uh, it's also the same as CPAP. So it's CPAP with a tube. Um, basically, this takes the place of the epiglottis. So the epiglottis maintains some internal PEEP for us usually. Um, with a tube in the airway, there is no way of maintaining that positive pressure. And so you have to have some PEEP to do that. And so uh, typically that tends to be around five. Uh, for patients with, uh, that are bigger or with smaller tubes, um, you actually want a little bit higher PEEP because that helps with the overcoming the resistance from the tube and um, some of those other factors. Um, you've probably heard in ARDS, the focus is on higher PEEP, and so you might see up to 20 used. Um, we really get uncomfortable once they get over 12 to 14. So keep that in mind. Um, optimal PEEP is something that's kind of beyond the scope of this talk, um, but really it's kind of finding that perfect uh, point where you maximize oxygen delivery, um, but uh, you don't uh, have the uh, negative effects of decreased venous return, decreased cardiac output, and barotrauma. So uh, that diagram at the bottom uh, shows optimal PEEP 
So you want to optimize your oxygenation, um, but having the least effect on um, venous return and barotrauma. For most patients, we start at five is kind of the bottom line. So those are oxygenation. Again, FiO2, PEEP. Those are your oxygenation settings, and you're going to titrate those, as we will discuss in the future. Ventilation, separate arm. Uh, first component for ventilation is respiratory rate. And so you may see a typical respiratory rate tending to be around 12 to 16 breaths per patient or per minute. Um, and that's very reasonable. Um, however, when you're setting your uh, respiratory rate for your patient, you want to um, keep in mind your indication for ventilation. So if they had a hypercarbic respiratory failure and their PCO2 is 120, well, they're going to need to start at a higher rate than 15. You may want to start them at 20 or 25, whatever they can tolerate. Um, also, if your patient failed because of metabolic acidosis and their pH is 7.1, um, even if their PCO2 is in a normal range, you know, high 40s or low 40s rather, um, you may still want to have a higher minute ventilation, a higher respiratory rate to help them compensate because now they're no longer going to be compensating on their own. So, so do uh, consider the patient situation when you're picking your respiratory rate. Um, also, keep in mind that they may be initiating more breaths like we talked about. And so you might set their rate at 15, but if they're initiating 25 breaths per minute, that's what they're going to get. And you may need to address that in other ways like sedation or um, even paralysis if, if needed. The other uh, component, again, to the arm of ventilation is tidal volume. So uh, tidal volume is the amount of air delivered with each breath, um, measured in milliliters or liters. Um, and so keep in mind, you know, my tidal volume is not going to be the same as like shack, okay? So it's going to be um, a bit size dependent. Um, when you're walking around the ICU, you'll probably see a whole lot of patients on 500. And uh, the reason that tends to happen is because, you know, if you think of the ideal body weight of, of an adult being around 70 kilos and you're aiming for six to eight mils per kilo, uh, that comes out to around 500. Um, but do keep in mind that tiny little old lady might, might actually have a, a perfectly fine tidal volume of 250 mls. Um, the big tall dude might need a tidal volume of 650 or more. Um, so keep those things in mind. Keep in mind the disease process. Again, ARDS, you may have heard, low tidal volumes, higher PEEP. And so those patients, you're going to, to aim on the lower side of that. And then with kids, all bets are off. Um, talk to the pediatric intensivists, but those, those volumes are much lower and um, still based on ideal body weight. So I keep uh, using this term minute ventilation. I probably should have put this earlier in the talk. What is minute ventilation? Minute ventilation is your respiratory rate times your tidal volume. And so when we use the term minute ventilation, um, it's a term about, you know, the total exchange uh, that um, uh, affects carbon dioxide. Again, ventilation affects carbon dioxide, and that's your respiratory rate times your tidal volume. As I mentioned, the respiratory therapists um, set some things within the ventilator. Uh, we're not going to dwell on that. That's beyond the scope of this lecture. Um, but that is something that's, you know, worth spending a little bit of time with the respiratory therapist to um, learn more about. So uh, what triggers the breath, how quickly the, the breath is delivered. Um, and then I to E ratio is something that you should at least be aware of. Um, so keep in mind, when you deliver a breath through the ventilator, um, you deliver the breath in, but you don't suck the breath back out. So the breath comes out um, as the patient naturally exhales from, you know, their, their chest wall collapsing and uh, the compliance of their lungs um, collapsing that breath out. And so 
it takes longer typically to exhale than to inhale. And so you want to give the patients adequate time to exhale. And so um, if you don't give them enough time for exhalation, then you can get some breath stacking. They may not have completed their exhalation before you're giving them another breath in. Um, and that's called auto peep. Um, Sometimes you can uh, adjust the I to E ratio, adjusting the time for inspiration um, to help with things like ventilation. Um, sometimes uh, for patients with, say, COPD, you also have to take this into account um, because it takes them longer to exhale. And so uh, there's a lot of um, considerations that, again, are beyond the scope of this lecture, but you should just be aware that they exist and someday many of you will learn more about it. So um, we talked about uh, making adjustments to these things, um, adjusting your FiO2, what do you titrate that to? Well, hopefully you got the picture earlier. Uh, you're going to titrate that to your saturation, not to your PO2. Again, PO2 will give you information about how the patient's doing. Your saturation is what you're going to use to determine your FiO2. Um, keep in mind also, and I didn't put it on the slide, but keep in mind you do not need 100% saturation. So your target, especially for a patient that's having difficulty with oxygenation, your target should maybe be in the ballpark of 90 to 92 percent, and that is perfectly fine. If you've got a chronic COPD or on HOMO2, they probably live in the mid-80s. You know, they're in the 50-50 club, CO2 of 50, PO2 of 50. Um, they probably live with a saturation in the mid to high 80s. You do not want them to be 100% FiO2. You're going to kill their respiratory drive. You're going to cause all the problems with excess oxygen. And so those patients um, in particular, you want your target to be 89%, you know, kind of where they, where they live. So uh, keep in mind your FiO2 needs to be titrated. Uh, titrated to your saturation. And sometimes this takes some work, I think, because it's a natural tendency for people to want to see beautiful numbers on the screen, especially uh, newer nurses. I think they have a tendency to want to see that 100%. And so they might, you know, tweak up that FiO2 uh, to keep those numbers looking good. And so sometimes you have to, you know, re-educate people that that's not our goal. Our goal is 90 to 92% or whatever appropriate number is the patient. Uh, PEEP, again, um, is related to oxygenation. Um, I think of PEEP and FiO2 the same way I think of um, vitamin K and FFP with INR. So FiO2 gives you a quick uptick in your oxygenation um, in the same way that FFP does, whereas PEEP gives you a more prolonged, uh, delayed effect in your oxygenation, similar to vitamin K. So um, for PEEP, uh, you want to think about it, several factors. Um, first of all, your saturation, as we discussed, but also your FiO2. So your saturation might be fine. Maybe it's 92%. But if you're on an FiO2 of 90%, then it's not fine. And so you need to optimize your oxygenation in other ways. And so increasing your PEEP can help with recruitment. And so if you're requiring high levels of FiO2, you should be considering whether you have room to increase your PEEP. You also want to think about your peak pressures. So we haven't talked about peak pressures yet, but peak pressures are the maximal pressure that that's being reached with the delivery of a breath and you can see that on the ventilator and if your peak pressures are high then that that sometimes um can limit you a little bit with your peep because your peep is contributing to that your peak pressure is your peep plus the pressure required to deliver that breath and so if your peak pressures are high sometimes that limits your peep a little bit um, if possible, you want to avoid uh, greater than 12. Sometimes we do have to creep above that a little bit. Um, and also keep in mind that there can be a delay before you really see the effect of your changes. Um, finally, I didn't put it on there, but 
um, keep in mind the effect on hemodynamics. So if your PEEP is too high, it may affect your venous return and affect your hemodynamics, uh, limiting your ability to increase that PEEP. Um, so here's an example. You've got a patient on PRVC or VCAC. Uh, their FiO2 is 70%. Their PEEP is 5. We're not paying attention to their ventilation yet, so we'll ignore their tidal volume and respiratory rate. You can see their actual rate is essentially the same as what you set. Their SATs are 92%. So their SATs are fine. Uh, we don't care about what their PO2 is. We care about their SATs. Their SATs are fine. However, they're requiring 70% FiO2 to get to that SAT. So that is not acceptable. And so at first glance, you might think, oh, SATs are fine. I don't need to do anything. But our goal should always be to drive down that FiO2. How can we do that? We can do that by increasing our PEEP while weaning down the FiO2. We are not making any of these changes based on the PO2. We're making changes based on the saturations. And again, the problem here is the high FiO2. So we're going to increase our PEEP maybe to 8 or 10 as we try to decrease that FiO2 down to 50, 40 most optimally, um, and strike a good balance there. So that's oxygenation, not too much to it. Drive the FiO2 down as much as you can and uh, keep the PEEP at a good balance of uh, maintaining perfusion and maintaining oxygenation uh, without, a, you know, with avoiding extremes if possible. So ventilation, the other arm, CO2 exchange, uh, affected by minute ventilation. If we're trying to deal with an elevated PCO2, so hypercarbia or respiratory acidosis, whenever possible, use these fancy terms. You are uh, going to be a doctor. You are going to be uh, discussing patients with other physicians and other professionals. Um, whenever possible, uh, use, use the fancy term. It makes you sound smarter. Um, it's exceptionally important in your documentation. Um, and it also just makes sure that everybody's speaking the same language. So when you're dealing with hypercarbia or respiratory acidosis, you want to increase your minute ventilation. And so you can do that by increasing your respiratory rate, or you can do it by increasing your tidal volume. So what are some considerations? Well, you have to think about what the respiratory rate already is. So first of all, is the patient breathing over the ventilator, what is their actual respiratory rate? Um, and do you have room to increase their respiratory rate? And we'll look on the ventilator at what that means. Um, so if the patient is already breathing at a high rate, then you may not have any room to increase their respiratory rate. Um, so that's a consideration. Uh, increasing the tidal volume is another option, but you want to be careful of your peak airway pressures. And so that's something to look at there. Sometimes you get stuck in a, between a rock and a hard place where the patient's already breathing at a fast rate and you already have high peak pressures and you still have hypercarbia that you can't deal with. And sometimes you just have to accept some hypercarbia uh, with the goal of, you know, avoiding higher peak airway pressures. That's a little bit beyond the scope of this talk, but still things to keep in mind. Now, if you have the opposite problem, a respiratory alkalosis or hypocarbia, that usually is because the patient's hyperventilating. And the question is, is this something that we did to the patient or is this something that um, uh, that the patient is doing to themselves. And so considerations there, can you decrease the respiratory rate? So if the patient is initiating breaths, then decreasing your setting for the respiratory rate is not going to help. And instead, you need to think about how you can functionally decrease the patient's respiratory rate. So how can you functionally decrease the patient's respiratory rate if they are initiating more breaths than what you set? Hopefully you're thinking about sedation 
or even chemical paralysis. Usually we need, usually we don't get to that point, but usually that means they need more sedation or, or pain control if they're hyperventilating because they're in pain. Um, so you need to think about, is it agitation? Is it pain? And treat that underlying cause if they're over breathing. Sometimes uh, for hypocarbia, you might want to decrease the tidal volume. Uh, keep in mind, this is purely anecdotal, but sometimes um, you can get a paradoxical hyperventilation. Um, you know, it's not natural to be on the ventilator, and we all, you know, take occasional big breaths. We all like the feel of a good breath. And um, if you're continually riding the patient at a low tidal volume, sometimes, and again, purely anecdotally, it seems to be younger patients, um, they might start to hyperventilate if they don't get um, adequate tidal volumes. And, and that's something that's really hard to parse out. Um, some of that has to do with watching the patient on the ventilator um, a little bit beyond the scope of our talk. Uh, in general, decreasing the tidal volume should help with hypocarbia or respiratory alkalosis, but keep in mind, if you're already at a pretty low tidal volume for the patient, it may not help. So now take in this example, uh, PRVC, oxygenation's fine. So ignore the oxygenation in this example, and instead you've got a patient with a tidal volume of 500, a respiratory rate of 16, an actual respiratory rate of 16, so they're, they're just riding the vent, they're not initiating more breaths, and that's your gas. You might wanna pause. So your pH is acidotic, your pCO2 is elevated, so you have a respiratory acidosis. How can you deal with the hypercarbia or the respiratory acidosis? The answer is you have inadequate ventilation. You can consider increasing your respiratory rate. Uh, the patient's not breathing over the ventilator. And you can consider increasing your tidal volume if the peak airway pressures are acceptable uh, and depending on the patient's size. So in summary about PRVC, um, it mostly mimics normal spontaneous breathing, and it does allow the patient to initiate breaths. Uh, it mostly increases uh, patient comfort, um, oxygenation, uh, helps with uh, recruitment, compliance, because of that constant interaction between the patient and the ventilator, things that are far beyond the scope of what we're talking. Um, in doing so, it decreases risk of barotrauma and volume trauma, um, but still, um, gives, you know, mandatory ventilation. Uh, looking at a couple of, uh, of what the, the ventilator actually looks like, because when you come upon the patient's room, um, this is what you look at. And so the first things that you want to look at when you see the ventilator are, what's the mode? So look in the uh, upper left corner here, it's PRVC. So that tells you, okay, I'm in PRVC, I should be looking for my four settings. Um, and so this is what we have down here. So at the bottom of the screen, you can see these are the things that are set. That's your set FiO2, PEEP, rate, and tidal volume. On the right-hand side, you can see what the patient's actually doing. And so peak airway pressure is up here. 29 is okay. Um, we definitely want to be under 30 when we can. Definitely want to be under 40 um, or else we start to worry. So 29 is okay, but it's much better when it's, um, you know, 20 or less. Um, but that's still okay. Uh, so that's your peak airway pressure. You can watch that. Uh, and then over here, you see your actual rate. So when the actual rate matches the set rate, it means the patient's kind of riding the ventilator. They're not necessarily initiating breaths. With this type of ventilator, if you saw a little bit of red, if this line here um, started a little bit red, that would mean the patient initiated that breath. We don't see that. Uh, these curves that you have, uh, this is the pressure. So again, it measures the peak pressure and you can see with each breath, uh, the pressure going up and then dropping back down to the peep. Uh, this is the flow, 
Um, so this is the inhale first at the, the upper part, and then at the lower part is the exhale. And this is where you can see if the patient has room to increase their respiratory rate. So the question is, how long between when they're done exhaling, where we reach back to zero here, and the next breath initiates. And so you can see this patient has lots of time between the finishing of an exhale and the initiating of a new inhale. So you have lots of room to go up on this patient's respiratory rate. Whereas if you saw this breath initiating much closer, you would not have room to go up. And then you can see your uh, volume in the patient here at the bottom. The actual volumes delivered, you can see in the bottom right hand corner, this is your minute ventilation, and then this is each individual breath you can watch. And even though we set our breath, um, and so this doesn't match, but I, I'm not sure why this picture that I got from Google doesn't match, but suppose this said 400, even though we set our volume at 400, um, it may not say 400 for every single breath. Um, again, because you have that constant, constant interaction between the ventilator and the patient, along with trying to optimize pressures, the, the breath is gonna average whatever you set, but it's not necessarily going to be um, exactly what you set. And so um, when you have the patient on other modes, this corner becomes important and that will be discussed in the interactive lecture. Uh, we did get dragger vents at ECMC, so most of our patients are now on these. It's a whole new screen to learn, which has been frustrating for some of us, but it's all in the name of progress because these are fancy. And so um, similarly, look at the top first, see what mode you're in. So this is in BCAC, um, similar to PRVC. Uh, functionally, you can think of them as the same. Um, and then you look for the same things, they're just in different places. So at the bottom, similarly to before, uh, this is where you see the things that are set. So we've got um, FiO2, uh, set tidal volume, set respiratory rate, and set PEEP. Um, the I time is also listed down here. So that's what's set. And then at the top, you can see what's actually uh, being delivered to the patient. And so uh, up here in the upper left corner, you've got your peak pressure. So that's not bad, 19, that's good. Um, you can see your actual respiratory rate here in the upper right corner. Um, again, this patient's practically riding the ventilator. Um, and then you've got your, uh, your different curves here. So you've got your pressure, again, your flow. So you can see, did we get back to zero before the next breath was initiated? Yes, we did. It's gonna vary in real patients. It's gonna, you know, in real patients that are actually a little bit awake, you're gonna see a lot of variability potentially between breaths and then your volume in, and you can see how that was delivered. So that's it. Uh, a lot of stuff, even just for right now, but the fun of it is when you start to actually apply it to more patients, and then also when you start to talk about weaning the patients. And so I hope that you found this to be clear um, and to give you a good introduction to uh, just the patient in a full control mode on the ventilator. Um, so now you can go back to your email and uh, look for that survey monkey link and you can do the quiz. Again, I don't care what you get on the quiz. I am gonna look at the quizzes because I'm gonna look at patterns. Um, if a lot of people are getting the same question wrong, I'm gonna see if uh, maybe there's a gap in knowledge presented or maybe a bad question. I think they were all, all good. Um, but do please do the quiz. I think that's a really great way to check your understanding of the material. Uh, and also guide me in terms of uh, what we'll discuss. Uh, and then uh, on Friday morning, um, we will have an interactive discussion where we'll look at ventilator changes. Uh, we'll look at an actual patient um, and their progression and how, um, how we would make those ventilator changes, how we would wean the patient off of the ventilator, what those weaning modes look like, and um, 
and take it from there. Uh, if you do want me to address anything in particular, you can also email me um, but uh, or put it in the quiz. Uh, there's a blank box there. Uh, so hopefully this works. I look forward to seeing how, how you all receive it.